Welcome to Roadcase, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Welcome back to Roadcase. This is Josh Rosenberg. Really happy to be here. Thanks for joining me. Um, we got a lot of great episodes coming up, so stay tuned for those. And we got a great one today. Um, really like to encourage everyone to become part of the Roadcase community. Uh, we'll be featuring exclusive interviews on our Patreon site this month. So if you'd like to become a member of Patreon and support this podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash roadcase pod. Um, and if you'd like to contact us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and we love email. So you can email us at info at roadcasepod.com with your questions, comments, or even suggestions for guests. You can also contact us through the socials. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at at Roadcase Pod. We also have a YouTube channel. And of course, you can subscribe to Roadcase on your favorite listening platform. And please click those stars. Uh, the more, the better to review this podcast and to rate it. Uh, that would be really cool. So today I'd like to introduce Eric Gilbert, who's the festival organizer at the Tree Fort Festival in Boise, Idaho. Eric has been anchored in live music for most of his life. Uh, he was in a band early on, um, loved Built to Spill and became their tour manager, took them around the country and on tour, even in Europe. Um, and he's been uh, involved in the Boise music community uh, for quite some time now and is responsible for bringing bands to Boise, both through his Duck Club promotions, uh, this promoting vehicle, as well as an organizer at Tree Fort Music Festival. Um, and he's really brought a new enthusiasm to Boise, which is kind of has the dubious distinction of being uh, quite an isolated town. In fact, uh, Boise is known as being the most isolated urban area in the lower 48 states. Um, kind of a dubious distinction, but interesting in the sense that um, a lot of bands will go to Boise because of Tree Fort. Um, they also come to Boise because of its proximity on the calendar right after the South by Southwest music festival South by Southwest music festival in Austin uh, just around the same time which is generally in March in a non-covid year of course things kind of changed in this year tree Fort also kind of had a distinction of being one of the first festivals to mark the cancellations of festivals and shows uh, in this country and the shutdown of live music so we'll talk about that kind of being at the front edge of that and Eric is also quite involved with the Save Our Stages Act at the time. Um, this interview was conducted in late September time frame. So Eric had been going back and forth to Washington lobbying um, the lawmakers that were involved in the overall COVID relief bill and the Save Our Stages Act Um in D.C., which as of right now, we know that it passed and uh, that fortunately independent venues will be getting uh, monetary relief because of the passage of this bill. So that's a great thing. But we'll hear what Eric was doing at the time uh, to help pass that act. So um, Tree Fort also had a very unique approach to raising money uh, for the festival since the festival had pretty much been canceled two weeks before it was set to begin in uh, back in March of. 2020, um, they created a private offering so that individuals could become investors in the Tree Fort Festival. And they were set to raise about a million. I believe uh, at this time, um, they closed the offering in, back in November 
on November 20th, and I believe they raised up to a quarter of a million dollars, which is fantastic, and is basically a uh, very unique approach to raise money for festivals, and I believe that it's unique throughout the industry. So we talk about a lot of these live music issues in Boise and how Eric has been instrumental in building up the Boise music community and how he came to manage this great feat that has been such a great boon for the music scene in Boise, Idaho. So thanks again for joining me on Road Case. I know you really enjoy this episode with Eric Gilbert of the Tree Fort Festival. So here we go. And I'm really happy to welcome Eric Gilbert here from Boise, Idaho. Hi, Eric. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome, man. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Just to get us started, can you kind of tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the music industry uh, initially and what sort of prompted you and what's kind of your, how that passion for live music sort of drove you into what you've done and where you are now and we'll kind of just go from there. Yeah, not to uh, start too much from the beginning of time, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, feel I mean, free. We got all yeah. time. You want. All right, cool. Yeah. The, you know, I, I got into, you know, I was, a, you know, I, I played piano a little bit as a kid, but I was mostly, you know, I was into, you know, I played sports and I was a pretty good student. And so, you know, not knowing what I want to do with my life, I went to college initially to be a chemical engineer and um, studied electrical engineering a little bit. And, but I, you know, I was doing okay in those first couple of years. I was doing fine in school, but I just was, you know, not really, you know, looking into the future, it wasn't like the future that was exciting me. And so I just mm -hmm. made, you know, I, I interacted the with chemical engineering wasn't exciting to you. Yeah, I was, I mean, to be honest, I, I, now, I mean, I'm fascinated by the engineering side of it, but at the time, like, um, I, to be frank, like the people that looked like I was going to be spending the rest of my life with, with weren't that exciting to me at the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was an element of that, but I remember meeting this guy and he was in one of my labs and he had, he had, uh, He'd come back, you know, I was at that point probably 20 or 19 or 20, but 19. Yeah. And then he had just come back to school and he was 32. And he was, I remember talking to him and he was like, yeah, you know, I spent, you know, most of the last decade following the, following the, the uh, Grateful Dead and painting houses and doing everything. But now I'm coming back now. I know what I want to do. And I remember that just kind of clicked for me. I was like, oh, cool. So I can come back. I'm going to, I'm going to like pivot now and focus on what I'm ex curious about and in, in the world. Right, right, right. So I started, I became a creative writing major. I was taking, you know, doing a bunch of writing. And then I started taking music classes because, you know, I was really intrigued. And before long, I was a music major, um, music theory ma major in creative writing minor. And, and you know, mostly, like, I wasn't. Where, where did you go? I went to the, the to University of Idaho, which is in northern Idaho, in Moscow, Idaho. And it's, mm -hmm. it's actually the Lionel Hampton School of Music. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, I really shifted from like thinking of school as a way to get a degree to go get a job to just learning about what I wanted to learn about, mm -hmm. you, you know. And so in doing that, I also became, you know, I just I remember a friend of mine pointed out how, you know, there weren't any cool bands playing on campus, but there was there was there was student p p positions for doing something about that. So I applied and got involved, stu you know, sort of student activities world but was just really passionate about reallocating money toward things that I thought were more exciting. And then, um, and I joined the, uh, you know, because I want to learn about like audio and stuff. I joined this, the student like sound crew. So I sort of just started, started like studying the whole world of music from all these different angles, um, you know, and was really excited to, you know, get into playing music particularly, but wanted to learn all these other aspects. So, through that, I, you know, I ended up meeting my wife actually in Vermont on a student exchange um, where I was doing, studying all like mu music and writing. And um, she was a, a musician and uh, doing solo kind of folk stuff at the time. And so when she, she ended up moving back to get her master's in music at the University of Idaho, through all that, we, we started collaborating with a lot of different <clears throat> folks and, you know, started a bunch of different bands in college and stuff. And, and, you know, and I started helping organize, you know, small little festivals and, and just house shows and stuff like that. And then wow. at one point in, in Ver that's in Vermont. No, that was when she moved back to Northern Idaho. Oh, with, okay. Okay. With, what, what instrument did you play? So I, I went back to school and I, my primary instrument was piano. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I was a key, a keyboard player, but play a little, little, little bit of guitar and stuff. So, right. 
at some point we formed a band called Finn Riggins and decided to just <clears throat> move to a smaller town in Idaho, which is a little backwards in some ways, but, hmm. and just to make that a tour home base, we were just really, really wanted to <clears throat> just sort of force our way in the, into the touring world from a very DIY approach. And, right. um, so we formed a band called Finn Riggins as my wife and I and, and a drummer. So with that, you know, we didn't have a bass player. So I was kind of playing left hand keys type of bass and leads. And we were, you know, all all original music. And um, and from that DIY, DIY perspective, too, just started, you know, I started booking our tours and, you know, we were running our own. PR, we're running our own PR and, you know, essentially, and we, um, we, we ended up randomly on a tour stop playing essentially a house show in Southern Colorado, met a, la a, a new label out of Portland, Oregon called Tender Loving Empire. And so mm -hmm. kind of quick, quickly signed to a cool new indie label out of Portland. So we sort of got associated with the Portland music scene for a long time, but we're stayed based in Idaho. And then, you know, and so there for between like 2007, 2011, we're, my primary focus as far as my involvement in the live music world was um, traveling in a van and, and booking those tours and playing shows all over the country and, you know, playing everything from house shows to festivals, you know, like South by Southwest and CMJ and right, in, right. in New, New York and all these things. So what time frame was this about? So that was like 2007 through 2011, you mm -hmm. know, so despite encouragement to move to Portland where our label was or some other bigger music town, we were, we sort of took the approach. We loved having our home base in Idaho and we're using the approach to just tour a lot. And, you know, our, yeah. our living in Idaho, our overhead was low. So it was easy for us to live on, just be touring a lot. So mm -hmm. we ended up getting on some like bigger tours, like with uh, built to spill who are based from here and, you know, getting the opportunity to play some bigger rooms and, um, and, you know, and that simultaneously we're continuing to, you know, host our touring friends in Boise by set, setting up shows and um, doing sound was um, like one of my side gigs when, when I was at home um, just to pick up work. And um, we started this thing called ranch fest that was on a, some private property that our drummer, his family had with a barn. And before long it went from, you know, being like a housewarming party to a couple day camping affair that was pretty much invite only, but about a thousand people showing up and 35 mm -hmm. bands and, Wow. And you, know, you organized that. Yeah, that was that was it was mostly like inviting our friend bands and stuff. But yeah, 35 and, bands. I mean, it's yeah. a lot of friends yeah. and a lot of bands yeah. and a lot of organization. And yeah, it was on a private private ranch. So yeah. there was like not permitting or anything it was yeah. far away, I assume, from everybody else. And you yeah. can play as loud as you want. You know, there wasn't those kind of issues. But yeah. taking the reins of your own band and just <clears throat> sidestepping traditional roots of having a manager and having a tour manager, that's was see, knowing where you, where you're going and what you've done after that, that was a logical step and kind of yeah. really tells a lot about what you've, what you've managed to accomplish since then. But mm -hmm. what were some of like the insane challenges that you faced in playing in a band and managing and booking all at the same time? I mean, that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, initially it was as simple as figuring out how to get Wi-Fi in the van, you know, just so, could use that time driving <laughs> right. to, 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 yeah, don't to eat be up booking. all your minutes. That's the biggest, the biggest takeaway. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. You know, so it was a lot of like finding that the ability to, you know, book in <laughs> advance and promote shows while moving it, you know, in a moving van. But, right. you know, at that point we had, we, we had scaled our life back so well, you know, we're so focused and we were basically when we went home, we were in a mountain town and we would just pick up some side work, but mostly be re rehearsing every day. And, you know, so there was enough of my time available to put toward all of that. But as mm -hmm. time moved along, and especially as we moved back down to Boise, because we did want to be part of a community, it you know became more and more challenging to sort of like manage all those things simultaneously. And it's hard right. enough when you're touring a lot to to uh, um, continue to write. You know, so yeah, like, that right, right, right. Yeah, right. you need to have that kind of like concerted down creative time, kind of right. Yeah, so it became harder to maintain the the way that was going. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I just think, yeah, it was, you know, but I think the upside of being able to do all that stuff on our own, you know, we were able to sort of like set our own agenda, you, you know, we were able to play things that, that were outside of the box. You know, we played a lot of small towns. We did a lot of things that were off the normal tour circuits. And mm -hmm. really, e even though we were a rock band, you know, we really tried to, in some senses, we were trying to think of ourselves 
from the sort of uh, old folk uh, or like the folk circuit of really just going from person to person and, you know, um, sharing our art with them. And we love like sleeping on floors and breaking bread with folks, you mm -hmm. know, and that was such yeah. a cool, cool way to get to know the, uh, the uh, country. But like you said, like doing all that sort of, I didn't know at the time what it, where it may lead, but it makes a lot of sense now, the skill sets and the relationships that I built doing all those things. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, yeah. That makes sense. Makes a ton of sense to me. So yeah. how did you, that takes us back to like the beginning of this decade, but I mean, a prior <laughs> decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and I know you were tour managing for built to spill for quite yeah. a while. Is this, did it kind of come out of this and um, what, what was that? What did that transition kind of so, look like? Yeah. So that relationship was built from them taking us on tour as a support band, you, you, you know, and so traveling with them and um, it actually came in and it was a little bit, it was ended up being, and so just getting to know them and, you know, I, uh, I put together a South by Southwest Boise showcase in 2012 because when we played South by Southwest in 2010, we were the only Idaho band and we sort of just got like, wait, wait, wait a minute. There's, we we got to get a presence here, you know, and so Built to Spill took part in that and Youth Lagoon and a few other bands um, at the time. And, you know, I just continued to work with them. And then we did another run of shows with them actually after Tree Fort started. So Tree Fort in the first year was in 2012. Yeah, I think it was that year we did. Well, we did some dates around South by Southwest with them, I think. And then maybe it was the year before that we did some other dates and just talking to them, they were headed to Europe again in 2013 and needed someone to tour manage. And they were frustrated with who they had had in the past. And because of our friendship and, you know, I think they just saw that I was able to self-organize and they're, you know, yeah, yeah. they're like, Hey, do you want to go to Europe and do this? And, uh, it, I just, yeah, I was like, yeah, I want to make that happen. And so, yeah, yeah, like how did you make that successful or was that a successful transition from your own band to just like, oh, you know what, guys, I'm I'm out of here. I'm going to Europe with Built to Spill yeah. to manage their tour. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. At the I mean, time, how, what did that what that kind of look like? Yeah, we were already <clears throat> my band was already, you know, scaling back our touring. We were taking yeah. a little bit of a breather and making room uh, for that. Okay. And so, so that was not organically issue. happened or over a little bit of time. Yeah, totally. And then. Uh, and then my band, you know, is slowly, I mean, we're still technically a band. We haven't played in, in a bit. My, my wife has a new band she's playing with. I have some, you know, I have another project kind of playing with, but, oh, okay. um, so we're still active on that, in that space. But, um, yeah, the transition into being a tour manager was pretty natural. Just what well, if you've kind of managed your own stuff, I mean, that's kind of, it's nice to have someone that sort of, you know, understands all of the mechanics of what a band really wants out of, you know, and it's part of it just being chill and yeah, you know, for sure. right, making right. sure things get yeah. done. But I never cool. toured. But I never been to Europe or toured Europe. So it was interesting. My first tour managing gig was going to Europe. Something I yeah, didn't for sure. had never done. <laughs> so. Over like that must have been amazing. Like just to step yeah. into a band that was a little pretty fairly established at that time, um, yeah. and to take them through Europe. Like what was mm -hmm. that? What, what well, was that like? And kind of what were the biggest challenges that you initially felt with yeah. tour uh, tour managing on that level uh, on that scale? Like what, what size venues were they playing at the time? I didn't. Me I haven't memorized yeah. what their twenty twelve. Oh, it's okay. Tour looked like. Yeah, the, in in Europe they were playing. You know, they, there was a couple of venues that were like three hundred, four hundred cap, but they also like in London it was like a twelve hundred cap and stuff. So they were definitely playing some mm -hmm. theaters. You know, theater yeah, style, yeah, but also yeah. in some, some markets smaller. But it was a bus tour. I, I will say one of the the advantages of tour managing built to spill too is they they're historically pretty self managed. So you know it wasn't like they were totally in the dark of what what had happened in the past. You know, and so it was pretty easy to like you know I was just able to take information from them and take guidance from them and put a lot of things together. But challenging thing of touring Europe is like the all the different monetary systems. Um, you oh, know, yeah, and sure. a lot of different uh, yeah a lot of different tax codes and different areas yeah i think it was going to europe without tour that was in 2013 that i understood the value of the european union like oh yeah like having a euro that in and having the ability to cross borders more sim simply in an area like that so um there were some language barrier challenges but in a lot of ways a lot of the promoters over there and they you know they take really good care of their of their of their artists and so the uh, first bus, yeah. the bus driver though, for, was a German who didn't really. We kind of butted heads initially, but we uh, um, made up by the end. So, <laughs> yeah. So you know, I really looked at you know, I was excited obviously to travel. I traveled a lot, but I was excited to travel with a band like that and get to know that world. But I, then, then I ended up doing 
all of their US or all, all their North American stuff in 2015. And, you know, I looked at it as twofold. One is fun. I love tra traveling, but it's also a great way for me to sort of learn how all these other promoters and everybody, you know, operates, you know, it was a great yeah, way for me right, to just right. basically learn from, you know, and, and then I ended up, their sound engineer had to quit. So I ended up then, I jumped in doing tour sound for them. Um, at, at one point, to be honest, I was doing tour sound. I was tour managing, doing sound and doing merch for them for like, wow. there was a stretch wow. of like three weeks where I was like a one man wrecking crew, which was beneficial in some ways, but also uh, had its challenges. But Man, uh, I mean, I hope yeah. you had someone helping you at the soundboard or what? Well, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the nice thing. Is, so to be honest, I'm a pretty decent sound person, but I don't know a lot of, you know, I don't know every single board and tech and stuff. When you're a touring engineer like that, you're working with the house, the, the house in engineer at, at every mm -hmm. stop so oh, okay most of them were super helpful i got to meet some just amazing engineers and some of them were annoyed i think with somebody with as little knowledge as i had come you know they i think they were just like how'd you get this gig like who are you you joker like i have to help you with all this stuff but <laughs> yeah right the entrenched european attitude of if you didn't study this for 10 years you're like nowhere yeah well that was actually in the states i didn't do sound for them in uh, oh this was in the in, states okay in, yeah, uh, for the 2013 Europe, or 2015 or whatever you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah so anyways it was a cool way to just see a lot of that stuff and you know, a lot of as doing sound is like there's a whole technical side. It's understand the system, understand the room, but in the end, it's also really understand the band. So that's why having somebody that knows your music on tour with you matters. So in a lot of ways, I was sort of like um, the finishing touch to their live sound. You know, while right. getting help from the engineer, the in-house engineers that knew the gear and knew the room. So right. Anyhow, well, I mean, you truly had your hands in a lot of different areas and knew a lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, what was like was it grueling for you to be on the road? I mean, what was that kind of like? Was, uh, like, what are the best things about it? What were the worst things about it at that time? And yeah. And to be, so that my, uh, you know, when my band was opening for built to spill, that was pre tree tree fort. And then sometimes during tree, you know, after tree fort started the, my tour management with them was after tree fort started. So I was sort of, it was a parallel universe at the time. Um, in fact, I was like, I remember in Europe, I was like still having tree fort meet, meet meetings, via Skype, you know, from the road, from the uh, green room and stuff. So um, I travel pretty well. I'm pretty, you know, re uh, resilient um, when it comes to travel. And, and I, I really love it. And I can kind of tolerate a lot. And so mm -hmm. I travel well, but it was, you know, so my daughter is about to turn seven and she was born and she was born, what, um, it's like a month and a half after I came home from that European tour. So mm -hmm. there was the challenge of being away with my you know, wife at home pre pregnant. And then, you know, in 2015 when I was traveling, she was, you know, one and a half to two, you know, it's just, hard. It, it, it became hard to like want to be away from home that, that, uh, that right. much, you know? So, so the really only yeah, yeah. challenges for me from that were like maintaining the work I was trying to do at home, but also just wanted to be around for my family. So. Yeah. I was going to say that's a nice thing with my wife being being in our band when we were traveling a lot. It's not like she was at home working while I was out like touring and you know in a different she was with me, which meant meant no one was making any money in our family, but it also meant that that she was at least <laughs> sharing the experience with me and Well, she uh, was with you before you guys yeah. before she was pregnant before you had the kids, so yeah, that yeah. was yeah, some good exactly. time to spend there, but yeah, yeah. so basically the hardest part was just to be away because you were starting yeah. a family at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's totally understandable. How long did you, how long did the tour managing gig with built to spill last? So and after 2015, yeah, after 2015, I sort of bowed out. They may made some transitions, you know, I've had the invite to join them a few other times, but really I was kind of, I'd got the experience I wanted. And as much as I love them and could listen to them play like every single night and could travel, mm -hmm. you know, I just, with my family and the other things I was trying to accomplish at home, I had to sort of step, step back. So, um, so I basically did that, you know, yeah, actually. So tree fort ended, you know, and is at the end of March. So that year, 2015, like two weeks after tree fort ended, I jumped in on tour with them to go. They played Co Coachella that year. And, um, and then I was gone most of the rest of that year um, with them. And so um, since then, I have a couple of one-off things I've traveled with them. But since then, I've, I've sort of hung up my tour managing hat. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So when you first started with them, were you, you were a fan of the band first or kind of – you? you I, I, can, I can hear from the way you talked that you were really – you were like the music. You were into yeah. it. Yeah. 
yeah, that's the other, that's the other thing is like, no, I, I like the people, but I also like the music. And as much as I love tour managing, I don't think I, I don't know if I could tolerate it if I didn't like the people or, or the, uh, or the uh, music. So, um, yeah, for sure. Those would be two <laughs> important ingredients in yeah. hanging out with the band. But yeah. what was that like if you were a fan of their music before just to kind of like step in and Laura kind of be a, on tour with them? Did that yeah. sort of figure into how you operated a little bit or? Yeah, I think to be honest, I mean, I was a fan of their music and, but I became a bigger fan of their music traveling and just watching them, you know, I've, which is in, 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 interesting. You'd almost think you'd sort of get sick of a band at that point, but I just gained a lot, a lot more respect for how they did their thing. And I just, you know, the music is really entrenched yeah. in me now. So. Oh no, you're just preaching to yeah. the choir. I don't yeah. think that, yeah. you know, if you like music, you can listen to it every day. I mean, hell, totally. twist my fucking arm, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it like, um, and being such, around? Sorry. I was going to say, they're such a great live band, you know, they like improvise yeah. a decent amount with, within it. And, you know, they mix their sets up and stuff. So it wasn't like a, you know, and so. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't like a Rolling Stone set or something like yeah. that. Same thing every night. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, what was it like seeing the different kinds of audience reactions from country to country? That must have, I mean, it's interesting in the States when it's not from country to country, just to see different reactions in different cities every night. Yeah. But was it a little bit different and was it super interesting just to be mm -hmm. in Europe or, or not? Yeah. Or what was that kind of like? Talk to me about that. Yeah, it was really, yeah, it was awesome. I'm, it's such a cool way to you know it's still the only way i've been to europe to be honest with, 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 with you and you know the downsides are like you 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 uh you miss a lot your your, your schedule is pretty much set for you but the upsides are you know get to see through that perspective and it was really interesting seeing different crowds and i was really interesting like the language barrier at times and i know you know some places were you know you know pretty you know a lot of europeans speak english but there were some places that, i mean i remember this one like older german fan that obviously couldn't speak English, but had all this like built spill vinyl and was so excited to see them. And <laughs> you know, it's just really interesting. And, you know, it's cool. And so they're, they're, they're from Boise. They're based here. That's one reason why I have a relationship with them. And um, yeah, it was so cool to see a band from here that had like, you know, had a thousand people coming out to see them in like Germany, you, you know, and, and, right, right. and yeah, like sure. singing cool their line, songs away. Right. Yeah. It was really cool. And, you know, especially people who consider friends and yeah, obviously respect and know they have fans, but it was cool to see, you know, but it was also, you know, they, they're they really cool, too. They'll pick up weird side gigs in the middle of the tour. Like, they played this weird, like, warehouse sort of house show thing on a day off in Switzerland in uh, Zurich. It was, like, this almost like a weird, like, commune, like, arts co commune that had a, you know, like a DIY stage and stuff. And, you know, I love just seeing wow. that sort of sort of behind the scenes of the local music scene there, you, you know, and I love that they're the type of band that loves to explore that side of things too. What was what, so that, what city was that again? Sorry. That was in Zurich, Zurich, oh, okay. Switzerland. Cause you've, cre yeah. you've created such a music scene in Boise by bringing tree for, mm -hmm. by promoting with the duck club. Um, mm -hmm. Do you look back on that time and seeing different things in such a far flung area that like, Wow, I mean, this is yeah. everywhere. These towns build this uh, music scene from the inside out, and it's all there. And we roll in, and twelve hundred people show up. And how was that? Was that inspirational for you? Yeah, definitely. And I think when I chose to go on those tours, it was partially just further, like uh, further, further research. You know, just like I mean, yeah. I just love learning all that stuff. But yeah, I definitely take seriously applying all that I've seen out in other places here, and also just. I've seen, you know, and I think when we first moved to Boise, so I grew up here, but then we were away and, and I grew up in the, in the suburbs and wasn't really involved in the downtown at all. And so mm -hmm. when we moved back here in 2009, the the scene felt really, and I'm not saying we're solely like to help turn around, but it felt pretty disjunct. It was, you know, when Built Spill rose out of here in the 90s, and I think there was this initial optimism when they rose up, there were some other bands getting attention. But when that dissipated, I think it led to some, um, just some um, cynicism around you know what people could do from here with their with with music you know and so traditionally Sounds it's kind of unfair yeah but it's also it's traditionally there's there's no like national media here there's no you know not, not right. a lot of visibility if you're playing here and not getting out of town and so you know people like us chose this tour a lot um and there weren't a lot of them doing that most pe people would move to seattle or portland or L la and eventually get absolved into those those scenes and so there was, but you know, 2009 was also the bottom of the recession. So there was this new spirit around like, Hey, you know, I, I don't want to move to a big city right now. Let's see what we can build, build here at home. And there became this new spirit around it. And those of us that had been out 
touring and stuff were like, hey, this is what's been working over here and like check out this idea. And one of those ideas was this sort of multi venue festival focused on relatively unknown bands and mm-hmm. and to highlight the local scene, but also to 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 create a better home for those touring acts here when they would come back at other times. Cause there wasn't, you know, at that point there was actually which is kind of weird. The, you know, here they're in Boise, college radio went off the air from being a traditional college radio free freeform station in the mid eighties. And there wasn't any independent radio here until radio Boise is a community radio station here, which I, um, I did, I did college radio in college and now I do have a radio show on the community radio station here, Oh, cool! Uh-huh. which kind of feels like a, you know, it feels like a young version of like a KXP or some, or something it has free 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 form elements of a college radio but a little more um programming to it but um at, so that went on air in early 2011 and that was the first time in a long time that that ind- that local bands could even get on the radio around here or or relatively unknown touring bands and so there had been this lack of visibility for the underground scene in Boise for a while so there with with that radio station going on air, every, there was some renewed optimism there, and this band Youth Lagoon rose out of here at that time through the sort of blogosphere, and so there there became this renewed optimism, and and for us too, we, I was skeptical of Boise still. We were traveling a lot. I was like, can Boise be a place that can harbor a really like vibrant live music scene, or do we need to move somewhere else? And so we started getting really involved, and and you know encouraging our touring friends to stop in Boise, and we would help them set up shows, and then this opportunity uh, kind of arose. Some folks were looking for some help. They were using about opening a venue, uh, Drew and Lori that, uh, but they hadn't ever done anything with live music before. They were just fans, you know, they are. And so, you know, they had reached out to some agencies and they'd gotten some feedbacks. Like you might want to find someone that knows anything about uh, the music world. Um, and so mm-hmm. they reached out to me, wanted some help with some shows. And that's when the plan for tree kind of got hatched. We had been playing a lot of, you know, there was this, a festival in Denver called Underground Music Showcase that my band had played like four years in a row. There was one in Portland at the time called Music Fest Northwest. And this was after Music Fest, Fest, Fest Northwest, I think, was done being a multi-venue festival. Um, anyways, we just saw the opportunity to, I mean, it's such a vibrant way. It's such a dynamic way to kind of catalyze a music scene. And, and that was sort of the intention behind Tree Fort. In its, yeah, I mean, prior in to... Prior to, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Prior to kind of getting this off off the ground, you had you were done with built to spill tour managing. What was there in Boise in 2012? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you all you talked about. I heard college radio and community radio. Were there no venues in Boise? Was there no, no scene at all? Or are you talking about kind of bringing in playing? Uh, independent underground bands on radio just to get Boise exposed because you're from there and you wanted people to get to know this music and expose people more to what's actually going on out there in the broader sense. Um, Where were you at? So just to kind of understand where, where, where it is now. So a good anecdote that I think kind of tells the story a little bit of where things were at in like, so when my band was on tour in 2010, we did a phone interview with this, a uh, journalist from Michigan and you know we were all in our van she asked us she asked us what's it like coming from a musically devoid state like Idaho and and you know we were just like whoa <laughs> like just because you haven't heard about it doesn't mean it's not happening so there was actually a pretty vibrant scene in the sense that yeah. there was ven- venues a lot of people making music and playing but it was I will be frank that a, 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 more so than it is now there was from a crowd standpoint, like the cover band scene was really popular and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And there wasn't as big of an audience in general for more of the like underground original uh, music scene. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, and so kind of what that anecdote from that interviewer, it was kind of, you were seeing that here at home too. There's not a lot of media. So there wasn't a lot of attention. There was just, wasn't a lot of sh- light being shown on some of the great art that was being created here. And um, mm-hmm. so so there were venues, but there was, you know, there's a big, there was need for more venues and there still is. And there were people making music and there were touring bands stopping here. But a lot of times what happened, especially at a certain level, touring bands would use this as their day off. Like they were all like stopping here and like getting a ho- a, a hotel and stuff, but they'd sort of 
Boise wasn't a high priority. They would stop here on their way to Seattle and Port, Port, Portland and use his day off mm-hmm. or vice versa. Right. But me coming from the touring scene, I, I know that they, you know, the West is crazy to tour and there's like huge drives, you know, anywhere. Once you get to, sh- 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 once you get to Chicago, you can kind of go a lot of different directions. Oh and, yeah. That's why I love being here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so I just knew that there was a, there was a big gap to be filled. Like people would love Boise from the touring scene, Boise to be right. a stop. Yeah. Production. From a geographical standpoint, it makes yeah. a lot of sense for sure. So that was kind um, of our pitch to the, the touring community too, is like, Hey, we're starting this new festival. We think it's a great way f- to get, you know, to great way for you to start in this market and for us to be able to introduce, um, uh, you know, there are music fans here. They just don't, they're just not used to going to see things they haven't heard of in, you know? And so um, that's one of the, so that's one of the, for me, one of the big successes of tree tree Ford is now there's a whole group of fans that come not to see any one headliner. They're coming out to come see bands they haven't heard of before, which most people don't buy tickets to things to go see things. They don't know anything about <laughs> or come from out of town, especially. Come, yeah. So how many people come from out of town to go to tree fort, by the way, do you have a, like kind of a sense of that it, from like about, hotel occupancy and shit? Yeah, I don't have, I do know it's about 30% of our pass holders and, and you know, on our, that's about like 10,000. So, you know, it's, it could, it's around 2000 pe- people. I would, I would say, right. you, you know, and so, you know, our festival is, 2000 total or what probably from out of town yeah uh-huh. it's hard for me to and know then, and there's sure. their total tickets for la- the last one was what yeah so our it's a there's a lot of different ways to experience tree for it one is to buy a five-day pass <laughs> and so i know i was like throwing you a softball on that to just give me yeah. the ticket breakdown no, no. <laughs> yeah totally. well so it's a little hard for us to tell but from a unique visitor standpoint just tracking unique people buying one thing like it could be just a beer at at the ale fort or, or something like that mm-hmm. that maybe they didn't have a tree fort full full five-day pass but it's about twenty three thousand pe- people wow. but Holy but shit. only about like two thousand you said or from out of yeah it's in about, general like well, it's about, well it's about ten thousand that have five-day passes so i was sort of basing the the 2000. So if you do, it was, if it's 30% of those, it's more like 3000 coming from out of town. So it's not like huge right. numbers, but, um, I yeah. mean, when they first, um, uh, when you first started to put together tree fort and the uh, duck club promoting, um, how many venues were in Boise at the time? So there were venues, but there were less venues than there are now. One of the things that happens during Tree Fort is we activate a lot of non-venue spaces and turn them into ven- ah, okay. venues. It might be like event halls and stuff like that. And so, but what that does is it shows, especially from the all ages venue standpoint, like there's a there's still a gap here for for that, and it's ebbed and flowed since you know Tree Fort started in 2012. Right. So there there was this initial, and that even. You know, when Tree Fort started, like I was saying, a lot of the there's one end of town of bars were booking primarily cover bands. But after Tree Fort, it, it sort of they showed them there was a market for bands that you know they still do cover bands, but they also will book original acts. So some of the venues that were active started pivoting, seeing that the so Tree Fort kind of helped shift the market that way. And there became a new you know folks were like, oh cool, I think I can open a venue now. I know that Tree Fort's going to happen once a year, that at the very least. And there's this new um, enthusiasm for live music here and kind of parallel to that Boise has been growing. It's been one of the fastest growing cities the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there yeah, it's, it's a growing, a growing market. And with live music and tree Fort being one of the sort of flagship events around here, right. it, it, it has encouraged a further development of the v- ven- venue ecosystem, which is also one of the concerns right now during COVID is yeah, how, absolutely. how much of that's going to survive. And, you know, as it's been building, um, but yeah, I think in general, you know, yeah, Tree Fort is, you know, the other thing, some of the other things it's done is like when we were touring out of here, we were like a novelty, like, oh, you're from Idaho. Wow, that's so exotic, you, you, you know, <laughs> and, and similarly from that perspective, that journalist, like, so it was, it was exotic in some ways and some ways may discount you, but I know the the bands now that tour out of here, like everyone's, everyone's more familiar that Boise has a music scene and they're like, oh, you're, you're from Boise. Awesome. Yeah. We would love for you to come play with us in San Francisco or, or something like that. So it's definitely shifted 
it's definitely helped shift the mentality of the local bands too. They, they really feel like there's an opportunity now. They, they know at least once a year they have a national stage here in town that they can prepare mm-hmm. for. And it helps, it helps encourage them to try harder and to develop their craft. And so that's kind of tree forts like this very large venue that happens once a year here with where before that there wasn't, there wasn't that motivating force quite to the degree that tree fort creates here. So, right. Yeah. How did, um, how have you managed the duck club, which mm-hmm. is your promoting vehicle and your yeah. promoting business with tree fort? It's sort of, it seems like what are the differences and how do they overlap? I mean, they're, it's yeah. clearly very complimentary, right? Yeah, I mean, very much so. And I don't think a lot of people even know this. It's a good question. So basically, after the first year of Tree Fort, like before that, I was kind of, I was helping book a lot of shows and promote shows, but just kind of as my individual self and no like brand around it, really. And so after Tree Fort, I was like, okay, we want to maintain this, this uh, momentum, we want to maintain relationships and, you know, fo- follow up on our promise of like building something here. But we didn't want to wear the Tree Fort brand out. And, and yeah. so um drew and Lori, who uh, helped co-found the festival originally they were going to they, they had this idea for this venue they were going to call it the uh, duck club which was um the the name comes from uh, Lori had lost her husband uh through a plane crash and um mm. and he had a hunting blind called the duck club with some friends and there's supposed to be an 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 homage to him and so um so anyways, that's our like, okay, cool. Well, why don't we make our year round efforts under the duck club moniker, you know, and that duck club puts on tree for it. But yeah, it's the same folks, the same core folks. And um, it, yeah. So that's kind of how that, and then we also had to have a touring and management sort of wing of duck club and have helped independent bands or not independent bands book tours uh, over, over that time too. So we sort of have like a, a direct sort of artist representation or artist advocacy as I like to think of it, um, wing of that effort too. So are all those bands Boise based? No, most of them through duck club. Uh, and most of them haven't been no, like, um, there's some that are Boise based, but, um, worked with a lot of Portland bands. Um, and some, I mean, some from around, some from out of the country, some from around the, uh, uh, the, the U S so over time, but yeah. What are you most proud of uh, in creating Tree Fort, and what was did it achieve? Kind of the goals that you had in your head, or have, did those goals kind of change over time? Uh, I think I think they've changed a little bit over time, but I think what I'm been, I've been most proud of, and and were I think, I think baked into the original goals, but I think that it accomplished things we didn't really you know foresee. But it it just it, it the music scene here was being taken seriously to the degree that like Tree Fort, I think in our third fourth and fifth year we were named the cultural ambassador for the city of boise so e- wow. even at like leadership le- levels they started recognizing like rock and roll had like value beyond just you know, you know and so became part of pl- planning conversations and how the city even thinks through what it wants to be in, in in into the future and then also just seeing like you know young young pe- people you know gain pride in their city and see their city as somewhere cool and somewhere that maybe they'll stay or at least they'll want to come back. And at least when they leave here, they're, you know, to some, I, th- I think there was a sentiment like Boise was uncool for a lot of us that grew up here for a long time. And I'm not saying tree fort solely changed that perspective, but it definitely has played a role. Yeah, I don't know why Boise got that rap. I mean, yeah. you know, I yeah. don't know, not through the skiing community. That's for sure. I'm a skier. And I'm oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, frankly, the only time I've been to Idaho is to go to Sun Valley, but I did fly through Boise. Yeah. I mean, My luggage ended up in Boise that nice, time. Nice. <laughs> and they like drove yeah. it to catch them or whatever. But um, that's amazing, though. I mean, that, you know, you've creating this musical center and making this tremendous effort to bring bands there and to create this vibrant music community and being very true to local values. I mean, I mean what kind of challenges do you face on the community level? I think, you know, initially there was, you know, there's natural skepticism over who are these jokers think they are, you know, and, and, um, you know, we were a great city before music. Yeah. There's been, you know, there's definitely the anti-growth folks who probably see us as a problem. There's some folks that, you know, we are a conservative state that probably, you know, I think there's definitely people, people that look at us through a political lens and think we're, we're encouraging the, the, pro, the progressive invasion of their precious state. Right. Um, but we do a lot to like make sure they get it, that we're inclusive of everybody. We're apolitical. We just 
think there's a lot of voices out there and you know so yeah 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 um, for sure i think one of the biggest challenges we've been seeing coming and you know pre covid is that um you know we started during a time where there was a lot of open commercial real estate and there was a lot of places pockets you know we were our main stage is on a on an empty parking lot and i just know as the city grows there's not going to be open parking lots there's not going to be empty commercial spaces and you know that's now with covid that's going to shift a little bit but us recognizing that you know we filled a gap at a time but once as this continues to build like where where is our where are we going to exist in a fully right. grown city and so um you know so that's sort of a byproduct of even our own our own success you know so sort of like we started trumpeting that uh you know that Boise is a great place to be and you can stay here and be a musician. But now all of a sudden home prices are making it hard for artists to live downtown. And, you know, so those are some of the challenges I think we've been facing more as a city, but also part of the direct community that we're pretty active in. So, And Tree Fort started out with like 200 and something bands, right? And now there's like that the last one was like 460 or 400 and yeah. you had 490 for the potential 2020 lineup yes. or something like that, right? That's something like that's, that, that's, yeah. That's amazing. Over a five-day period, yeah, and just that, that's an incredible amount of growth and just a ton of bands that and yeah. people in the industry just saying amazing things about it too. Yeah. And well, and for those unfamiliar too, over time it's developed. There's multiple forts, which uh, are yeah, big. I've seen that. That's super cool. Yeah, and all those have been built because people from within different pockets of the creative community have reached out and be like, "Hey, this is so cool. You guys are doing can can I start a story fort?" Which is like all the literary com- c- community and you know, we're really, one of the core principles of Treefort is that it's, you know, it's sort of um, built by the artists that it's for, you, you, you know, and I'm, I represent that on the music side most directly, but then, so the story for it is built by folks from within the literary side, you, you know, and so, yeah, for those that aren't familiar, there's a story for it, there's a, there's a skate for it, there's a hack for it, which is a tech component, there's a, uh, um, there's a food for it, a ale for it, a yoga for it, a drag for it, an art for it kids for it <laughs> and so <laughs> the point being is that there was 400 some bands but there was also over that five day period there was over a thousand different e- events on our schedule all representing all these other pockets of things too and the cool thing that I, I i really love the tree fort and that wasn't part of our intention to begin with we sort of let it happen as, as it happened but it's right. created all this like intersection and collaboration across you know like we all get stuck in our silos and you know we all love what we love and and you know I used to go to poetry readings, but I don't go to poetry readings very often anymore. I go to rock shows and uh, other music shows, but during tree for it, I'll stumble into story for it and see something I wouldn't have ne- necessarily, you know, done on a different time frame. And so you get this cross pollination that has really built this cool collaborative spirit in the creative uh, co- community here in, the, in the general. So it's been cool to watch yeah. it develop in that way too. Well, one of the coolest things I read that you, I think you had said it, or one of the people in tree for had said that you, go with a favorite you, you go with for a band that you really like but you usually leave with like a new favorite yeah. and that's the best part of a festival totally know? yeah um, how's the crowd been kind of in like is it a crazy scene is it, it sort of depends on the like from a mute from when the music's going on i mean what's that kind of like it's it, it's both it's very fa- family friendly there's definitely things that are more family friendly than uh, than others um you know and a lot of it starts in the daytime so there's definitely a daytime vibe and then there's a yeah, late, and, and, nighttime. and we go you know some of the bands sometimes when they haven't played before they're like i'm gonna my set's at one in the morning like who's who's gonna be out at that point i'm like oh it's gonna be packed don't don't, don't, <laughs> right. don't worry you're all taking a nap right now yeah, but they'll yeah. come back <laughs> yeah so it goes you know it goes you know, it's usually like noon till two in the morning and yeah, it gets crazy, but you know, it's pretty respectful. The thing that bands love about it too, is it has that sort of showcase style festival vibe to it, but it, but they're music fans, you know, it's mostly pe- people getting wild, like dancing crowd. crowd yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's fo- focused wildness. On yeah. Music for sure. Right. Yeah. And it's, a, you know, sometimes some of the criticism around, you know, some of these festivals have been around a long time is it's all industry folks, but the industry folks are here. They're just crowd surfing too. They're not, they're yeah. a little less like taking notes. And like, I don't know. Oh, that's awesome. Cause that's so, what I do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not the crowd surf exactly. part, but like the general yeah. get insane with the music attitude, which exactly. is what I love. So it's a like, very, how can, you, how can you not? Right. Yeah. So the crowds tend to be like really great crowds. I mean, the people are just into it. And that's like, yeah. you know, part of tree Fort too is like what we used to love this style of festival. Cause it is, 
seeing artists in intimate spaces for the most part, as opposed to big field style festival. And that's the kind of mm -hmm. music fan I, I am. I, I get the sense that you probably are too. You like to see. Yeah. Them. I mean, I like it all. I mean, yeah. I'll see my favorite band in any venue, but yeah. yeah. Also to see like really excellent musicians in a smaller size venue is really mm -hmm. cool. And it can right. make you, makes you, you can super appreciate a band that you may not have appreciated them, you know, mm -hmm. being up close and personal with them. You know, totally. I'm a person who likes being as close as I can just because I kind of just get yeah. drawn to it and just yeah. love it. Right. And I'm just all of a sudden I'm just in front and like mm -hmm. I just like watching musicians do their thing and play in a live yeah. live setting. I mean, that's kind of the best thing, which yeah. we're not doing now because of fucking yeah. COVID. COVID. And so like you've just gotten. Oh, God. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about how yeah. you strategically put like tree forts right after South by Southwest, which is, mm -hmm. I know is kind of helped put it on a lot of bands, different calendars. But then I think like, oh yeah, I remember back March, like South by Southwest canceled. And then you guys are right after that. And talk to me about a little bit about ex the history of it, but tell me what's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. So the whole being the weekend after South by Southwest was, yeah, it, you know, one of the things that really, it, you know, to be honest with you, it was really born in solving an issue for the bands. Like, you know, one of the things, there's so many bands traveling at that point in time. And I just knew that from being in a band trying to book tours around that time. And especially out West, like that there's only so many venues in each city and that, you know, so basically it kind of happened like the year before we started tree, tree for it. I helped a couple of bands touring after South by Southwest, like set up a show and then we were going to play it. And we added a couple other bands and before long there was, there were six bands on it, but I just, trying to help promote it. I called it a mini South by Southwest after party or something like that. Yeah. And press picked it up and all these other bands started hitting me up wanting to play it. I'm like, Whoa, it's just a show that I rebranded into being, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I saw all this demand for bands, you know, so basically like there's all this traffic, there's not a lot of stops out West. So basically we are able to create a very large and worthwhile stop for all these bands traveling at that time. And in large part, a lot of them traveling initially, at least traveling, from Austin back to the West and, and, you know, it gave them a stop on their way home. And, right. um, you know, what that was, are you competing with like Denver in that? No, not, not really. Like they, you know, they all hit Denver on their way and you, you know, yeah. so we're not stopping anything from there. Um, and in fact, it kind of works out good because like, if you leave Austin, like the first couple of days, it's going to take you about three days to get to Boise anyways, three or four days. And, you know, we start on Wednesday now. And so if you leave Austin on Sunday, you can, play a couple of Colorado dates and, mm -hmm. and then you hit salt, salt Lake and then land in Boise and stay, stay for a, a couple of days. We treat right. you really well. We're kind of like the, like spa, the, the spa experience after you're, you know, you were kind of like shuffled around at South by Southwest. And so, yeah. How do you achieve that? You know, how yeah. do you, I've heard, I've heard a lot about like tree forge is the best. They treat the bands the best. Like it's just amazing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Eric's this great guy wow. and who's, you know, been doing it on the ground for so long and knows what bands want. And like, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of just that welcome home to Boise kind of thing. Yeah, it goes. I mean, there's a lot of community involvement in that. And we have, there's this, a really great leader. She's been part she's one of the, you know, part of the founding team. Her name is Steph Quell. She runs our band hospitality, but she's so great at like getting the, all the, the, the um, local restaurants and stuff involved and just um, contributing to this really like cornucopia uh, of food for this artist lounge that artists mm -hmm. can go to like wow. all the time. And the Boise rock school here, they all do individual hand-drawn bags for all the bands inspired by their band names. And it just has this like real personal, touch you know going from just like a number at south by southwest and no, no you know south by southwest is, is what it is this isn't criticism of that but this is why bands love it though is they get this real personal experience with yeah with, well, with a way to differentiate the experience right yeah and um personalize it yeah and so and then there's just this general sense like everyone in boise is excited to i always joke because it's like there's there's welcome welcome to boise welcome to tree fort like stuff everywhere and it's almost like because we are the most geographically isolated uh, metropolitan area in the lower 48 states. So I like wow. to joke. That's joke. a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I like to joke that it's like the community here is like, oh, we haven't seen outsiders for so long. Hi, welcome to our city. You know, so, <laughs> here's a bag with here's the a bag, new yeah. logo. Here's your new band logo. <laughs> yeah. So the whole community kind of pitches into that spirit that makes bands just feel like, wow, this is so great to be here. I'm 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 happy to be here too. Thanks for having me. You know, and, right. and what I love is that translates to all the bands of all sizes. And so yeah, and so there's that experience. And and so that was kind of why we ended up the weekend after South by Southwest, recognized that there would be a lot of 
people that would want to play because of the timing and the location. And then over time, though, that has shifted. And one of the things South by Southwest definitely still helps us with is being able to get as many international acts as we do, because a lot of them come over for mm. that in particular and are in the States trying to fill dates. But other than that, we've seen like it's definitely shifted where there's definitely a lot more bands now that aren't necessarily doing South by and they're just choosing to come to tree for it, or they're just doing a different route and stuff. So the reliance on that timing has shifted, but it is still actually a really, we really like being at the end of March. Um, Cause it's, it, it fills a gap in the community here. It's really, it's kind of the first time everyone's kind of coming out of their hibernation. So it has that really like firsty event of the season. Yeah. And, yeah. There's a certain energy, energy in March and, yeah. you know, in winter yeah. like towns. Yeah, and granted, sometimes it snows on one of the mornings, and it's you know it has yeah. its downsides, but it's mostly it's mostly nice. But so with that said, then also with you bring in COVID, and and yeah, we we had the distinct opportunity of being on the front uh, uh, crest of of that wave. It was, the frustrating part of that initially was just the lack of clarity coming from anywhere in actual places of leadership. It <laughs> so um, right. and yeah, all right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, so that was frustrating. Lack of general, a general lack of leadership in yeah. general, like from the I top like to, down. I like to joke a little bit. It's like I'm a, we're we're festival organizers in Idaho. We're not usually making national security decisions, and, right? You know, but we felt like we kind of were our hand was forced to do so, and so yeah. So you know, with that, all that. So obviously, we've postponed, and it's you know it's really challenging because it's two weeks before we're supposed to happen. You know, and um you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of financial liability around that and it's posed some yeah. new challenges for us. Um, through it though, I'll say like, so we've been helping with, through Duck Club, we've been helping with some safe and socially distanced live shows this summer outside. And, and yeah, you know, I saw that nice little, that little amphitheater or something. Yeah. Like outdoor, yeah. yeah with, beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. With this great new restaurant. We partnered with, yeah. um, with a restaurant, a yeah. local restaurant, Ken or something, yeah. right? Ken, yeah. yeah. They've been all outside stuff and they were new and we're about to open. We knew them from some, one of their previous projects and they've been great. And, you know, at first I was really hesitant, you know, coming out too, but then it's been, it just has reminded me why, why live music a matters and so important. And also why I think it's, it will come back and, you know, and is, you know, it's the way we see our community a little more passively, you know, we don't have to set up a conference call to talk to somebody where we're, we're um, you know, it's where you, you catch up with your local co community and also just live music itself. But I mean, it was interesting just experiencing it again and, you know, it's different. It's not sweaty and you no know, hugs and hug, hugs and high, uh, high fives yet, but, Right, just, just what it does and how it brings people together, and you know, I love one thing that I love about live music is you can be amongst other people, but also just sort of internalizing it too. Like, there's something about once once the music stop starts, it it's you know you can stop talking, you know, you can just listen and and just think and yeah, hear that all you show talkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So but no, it's being into the music and also, but it's that added energy of everybody else being yeah. into whatever vibe they're into, but it, it adds to the experience, yeah. obviously. When was the first, yeah. um, yeah. when was the first show outdoor show that you did? Uh, early July. And what, and, and what, what kind of decision making process did you go through to say, okay, yeah, we're going to do this and we can do it here. And what were they, and how was the attendance and have there been, uh, what's been the result of it from a, not, not only like from a community perspective, but from a business and health perspective too. So obviously we're hesitant just from, you know, the public perception side of it and also just wanting to be safe, feel safe for ourselves, make sure. But so we, the first one we did actually was with the, um, there's a botanical garden here and we've historically helped with a summer series there and we pushed it back. And usually there's like 800 people there, but we, you know, we limited it to 250 and, you know, basis, you know, required masks. And luckily the mm -hmm. city did a mask mandate right before the first one, which helped us enforce that, which was good and required oh, masks, good. unless you were on your blanket in your zone with your folks, we, and we, you know, instead of serving beer was did no, did no vendors. And it was just bring your own drinks and food, which is a pretty good upside right. to the, to the public and, and it limit, limited the touch points. And, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's been, you know, and there was no dance floor and stuff like that. And it's been real safe. And then the one with Kin, this outdoor restaurant, it's only been 50 tickets. And mm -hmm. and um, and they have this little natural amphitheater kind of thing that they didn't yeah. you know, they didn't really have before, but they made happen. And 
what's cool with that, they, they serve you food, but when you show up, the food's already there and this cool like Tiffin's. And then if you want to order a drink, you text text the bar and they bring it your drink to a zone you go pick it up and so there's very little interaction with other folks oh, that's and, cool yeah it's been really so uh, almost all of these events have sold have sold out they've been at lower capacity so there's less tickets and plenty of pe- people that want to get out of their house and go see some live music so it's been you know the margins are tighter for everybody but at the same time we've all just been thankful to have something to do and to help our businesses stay relatively like bleeding a little bit less. Um, so what, so tell me about tree Ford and COVID and moving it around and what sort of, obviously that's presented a ton of challenges and um, taking it to September and what happened like financially with, uh, with moving it and uh, having bands on the bill. And what does that look like from, from the bottom line perspective, from an organizer's uh, point of view, it must have just been crazy. Yeah, I, you know, so we initially postponed this September, which would have happened just this last weekend. Um, mm-hmm. in, in in from this moment in time, the um, and at that, you know, we moved most of the lineup pretty quickly, and you know, people were at that point, everyone was just moving their tours anyway, so it was pretty easy to move. And you know, we we sort of moved the big building blocks and stuff and we didn't get into fine tuning it yet. We knew there was a lot of unknown still. So we, so in that sense, we've done the same thing again. We, we, we now postponed it to September, 2021 um, to, you know, we, our intention is to go back to March cause we like that time frame. but for next year it felt right, uh, right. the smartest to get as far out as possible. Um, yeah. And how are you going to manage that? The net, the six month jump, is that going to be, a particular challenge for you when you do like when you go from September 2021 yeah. to March of 2022. Yeah, we've already been talking with the team about like we're basically going to be planning both simultaneously because usually yeah. there is a sort of like okay the festival's done wrap it up take a breather start the next one we're not going to have that opportunity this time so right and then South by you've known they're they're going back to the March yeah. of 2022 they're going back to it. You know? Oh, did, did no? I don't. Uh, know. I don't know. I didn't hear that. I wondered if you knew if they were doing nope. that too or we haven't uh, heard. And in all likelihood, it sounds it stands to reason that they probably you know. Yeah, I know they announced they're they're doing online stuff with some in person potentially depending on what sta- says things for this coming March. Um, and then for us, you know, 2022 will end up being our 10th, 10th uh, festival. So we were just like, you know what, let's let's commit to going back to March because we like the time frame for a lot of different reasons, celebrate our 10th year. And then, you know, one of the things we keep thinking is September is much nicer weather here in Boise and we might get a fan uh, petition to basically for us to keep it in September, but we'll see. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I just think we fill a bigger hole in March, and we really like that, both in the region and uh, and 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 locally. So, um, right. but the six month turnaround is going to be challenging. Um, mm-hmm. I think in the near term, with you know next year's festival or the you know the the postponed festival that's now in twenty twenty one, you know we just we're emailing artists actually you know, this 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 week. They you know and er- everyone that was on the original lineup is being invited back, and then we'll fill in holes from 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 there. From, you know, I think the biggest, I mean, the biggest challenge has been also like, yeah, the financials, you know, like a festival like ours, there's not a lot of margin in it to begin with. It's, you know, right. we, we weren't built to, we, we were a for-profit festival, but we weren't, we weren't built with profit in mind. We were built with sustainability in mind and creating what we wanted to create. So there's a lot that gets put back into the festival. So when we had to yeah. postpone like two weeks out from the festival, um, most of the ticket money at that point had, had been spent on getting it built to that point. And then we sell a lot of, you know, there's a lot, the rest of our um, revenue comes during that final two, two, two weeks and during the festival itself. So um, uh, a lot of sunken costs when you yeah. run right up to two weeks before a festival yeah. must've been just crazy and insane in those first couple of days, yeah. first couple of weeks. Yeah, like, was God, a... dude, can't even imagine it. Yeah. And so, you know, we, there was enough of like, cash flow cushion to like get us to that initial phase we did get some ppp and stuff but and luckily most of our ticket buyers like about 10 percent, took refunds we we wanted to make sure to offer refunds um just because we're close with our um fan base and 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 thus you know a lot of them didn't which is great but it also means that 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 ticket inventory is not on the table for next year so now yeah that's the that's the interesting part of all this i'm like yeah yeah. Um, so only 10% chose to get refunds. Correct. So most people kept their tickets for next year. Um, 
which is great, but it, like once again, it just means like, the, but that source right, of you're not just revenue. Gonna, that, that's revenue was spent to set up yeah. that first festival, and now again, so yeah. that takes us to raising money for the next festival, mm -hmm. and then you've created this really interesting. Uh, join us as partners of Treefort on WeFunder, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, tell, yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. So, so we're a certified B Corp, which is a benefit corporation. You know, which I encourage people to go look at that. It's a cool new move movement in the business community, and it's a little. And I only bring that up because WeFunder approached us a couple of years ago because they too are a B are a B a B Corp, and you know they they're sort of this. The easiest way to describe it from my vantage point is they're sort of like the the marriage of crowdfunding and um, and uh, micro in in uh, investing, and so you know it's a really interesting model, you know, in the sense and why and they approached us a couple of years ago and we're like we're like hey we think it's a great fit for your, for you guys and we're like well we don't really have a reason to raise money right now, um, but then in June of this year we're like hey got, got back to them like well, we have a reason to raise money right now and let's yeah, right, let's right. talk about this and. You know, it's, and this it's, is different than crowdfunding. I mean, this is an S SEC yeah. yep. um, uh, regulated uh, public offering in a sense, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. it's complicated. That's one reason why we hasn't before. But now it's like, and what we liked about it, as opposed to just doing like a GoFundMe or something, is it just feels like we're, you know, we're the exchange is, has a little more value for those that that decide to to support and invest and. We really like. I mean, we we feel community owned all, all, already. There's so many PPB people that volunteer or or help out in all these diff, different ways, and it felt like a cool way to like con convert that spirit into actual ownership shares. And yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. it's a phenomenal idea, man. Thanks. My only question is, how does return on investment get realized? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we we've been trying to be really clear about this because that's one thing, and it's tricky to be clear about. It's a, there's a lot of information to, but so. As far as an ROI, we've been trying to be really clear. Like this is crowdfunding. This is mostly like like a cultural and social impact. You're supporting something that you care about. Right. Now, I mean, let me also say parenthetically that I'm not saying no. I'd have to be involved in this totally for return on investment. Totally. But if that's the way it's set up, I was kind of wondering. You know, obviously. Yeah private shares offered is there a market going to be an ultimately an end user yep. marketplace for those private shares so, so yeah so yeah, yeah. so yeah to answer that question we funder there might eventually be a marketplace where you can resell your shares currently no but it's kind of similar to in this where it's a little similar to the green bay packers model like there's no resale mm -hmm. market but sometimes those shares come back on and so we've been thinking a little bit in the spirit of the Green Bay Green Bay package. It's definitely a different setup than right, yeah. than that. But so the ROI would be, you know, if if you ever want to from the the ROI from the monetary side is, it, you know, profits have never been distributed internally to the current owners of the festival. But if there's not theoretically, there could be profit distribution at some point. You know, if it stabilizes and it's doing well. So if that were to ever ha happen, you could see dividends from any profit mm -hmm. distribution. One thing I like about that too is it sort of answers the question: is like, is is there someone being distributed all these profits on the behind the curtain? And now it's a great accountability thing too to our community. Is like, well, if profits get distributed, you'll know because you'll you'll get some. <laughs> right, and, right, right. And then, yeah, if, you know, the goal, and this is what we've articulated, the goal is also is to to discourage Tree Fort from being sold to some, to a live nation or some bigger. Mm -hmm. out, and so, but if that were to happen now and you are part owner, then you would benefit from that sale. Now, the goal is right. to prevent that from happening. <laughs> and so, um, so that's kind of, so to, to answer your question, we've been trying to be clear. If you buy, if you get shares, you're most likely going to hold on to them for a long time, as long as tree fort exists and you're, right. there's no way for you to really. Well, or once, is there, is there a cap on the number of investors or is it, it's just, yeah. you, it's when you get to that 1.05 million and what happens when you go, so yeah. let me explain that. No, I mean, from my understanding yeah. and correct great. me if I'm wrong, but I mean, there was a 1.05 limit in the total, the amount of total investment that mm -hmm. you can collect or that you is occurs underneath this we funder mm -hmm. process right mm -hmm. so uh a is that limited to a certain amount of number of investors because when that caps out obviously then an aftermarket can be created i mean we can yep. even use like the stub hub model right? it's oh, like yeah. oh well here's a spot you can buy my spot and this is how much it's going to cost now and take yep. it off my hands or even private transactions could occur yep. um and what happens if you hopefully when, let's say when you exceed that yeah. 1.05 million mark. 
it's kind so of I will say complicated so, full question. No, it's no, it's a really <laughs> great question. And I think the opportunity to talk about it is really good. Like, so there's awesome. two things. Like it is a there is a the offering right now is scheduled to close November 13th. So um it is also just oh, a, so it gets you, closed with a number of investors at that point. Yep. Um oh, and okay, that's cool. There's a number of shares that are available, and I, I knew this number a little while ago, and I should know it, but I can pull it up real fast. Um, yeah, and for those that are interested in looking at some more, if you go to wefunder.com/treefort, you can look, and there's a yeah. lot of, you can see like the financial uh, dis disclosures of. So we we put fifty thousand shares into the offering. So if all fifty thousand of those are sold, because yeah, mm -hmm. twenty twenty one dollars per share. So yeah, that would. So if, if we, if the full offering, if we reach the full 1.05 million, I think is how you'd say that, then, mm -hmm. then, then it's closed. But we also, there is a timeline on it too. So, um, okay. so yeah, there is a finite amount. And okay. yeah, I didn't realize there was a timeline on it. So, yeah. so it's whatever it's, so it's closed at that point and there could be a secondary offering at some point in the future. Uh, how'd you come up with this idea and like what, yeah. um, what sort of prompted this? It's kind of, I I don't know, but I would imagine yeah. this is kind of unique. It seems around. I don't think there's any other festivals that have done this yet. You know, <laughs> one analogy I use recently. That was my. That was my sense. Yeah, sometimes you know, being someone that comes out of the DIY scene and then has now promote shows and charges tickets to shows, I've explained it sometimes to folks like, especially kids in the DIY scene that are like, "Wow, man, why are these tickets twenty dollars?" I'm like, "Well, it's basically how we're all crowdfunding this band to come to town." In you know, yeah, so, right. And so for us, really, like this, this offering was a way to, you know, fill this, you know, this inventory gap and, and still want to offer something of, of, of value and this idea of sort of inviting people in closer. And, you know, there are some traditional like crowdfunding perks, like at certain levels, you get discounted tickets or early access to tickets or some special experiences you'll have access to. So we also are seeing it as like joining the club and we're calling it like community ownership club. And at a certain level, it's gar Guardians of the Fort, which is kind of a fun. Oh, that's really event. cool. Yeah, I like so, that. So, and then, but it was also just, I, 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 you know, I sort of, we sort of like this idea of people feeling like they, they truly can say they're part owner in this thing that they, that they care about. And it's from a right. le legal standpoint, I think, I think also though, that's been a little confusing for folks, to be honest, they're, it's, it, it's a little more like, I would say it's, it's a little in intimidating, intimidating. Exactly. It's like, whoa. Yeah. Seems like a big step. An investor. I'm an investor. investor. What the fuck? I know. <laughs> Very Dude, much. it's a great, it's a great idea. It's so like in keeping with everything that I've just learned about you and mm -hmm. what you're doing and involving the community and making this like the first music festival yeah. that's going to offer public, sh you know, shares to the public. And Thanks. it's a great time to do that. I mean, how has it been working out so far? Good. So we've so far, I don't know how many shares it is, but yeah, we we've, 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 raised two hundred fifteen thousand dollars and which is i mean i'm thankful and amazed that we've raised that much obviously there's there's more room we just crossed that we now have 501 new owners in in uh tree in tree fort which is cool and you know i think it's going to yeah. come with some new challenges for us like because we're gonna we, we we need to honor those those investors appropriately you know we're going to have a new pattern of financial di disclosures every year, but we're also just excited mm -hmm. about that opportunity to be further transparent, which is something we've kind of tried to embrace the best of our ability. And yeah, we're, right. we're all kind of learning, like you said, I mean, it's a legal, it's an sec filing. It's like, it's a whole new, it's Oh a, yeah. This is big time, dude. Exactly. I know. It's, it's, I was surprised I didn't see in a suit and tie, man. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's overall, I think people, those that are, are understanding it, think it's really cool and are excited about it. And, it, and, you know, at the very least it's a cool badge of honor for for them to kind of own a portion of this thing that a lot of them have helped build. And, and, um, so, yeah. How deeply underwater are you guys at this point with having had the, the, you know, 2020 completely canceled and then it's not going mm -hmm. until late 2021 now. I mean, yeah. obviously you didn't have a lot of refunds, but then there's a, just a lot of new costs and things mm -hmm. that you, you know, money that you lost, just not being able to put on the, what the, the 2020 show, what does that kind yeah. of look like? So it really is about a, a million dollars in basically like, if you look at sponsorship money too, most of that's being rolled over the next year. So it's basically, for me, it's a little less like, it's more like revenue unrealized or, you know, in some ways it was kind of spent. And so, I mean, revenue unrealized is much higher, but yeah, that's about the amount of money that, 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 that's the gap that we do need to close to, um, 
to, you know, put on the type of festival that we're used to putting on, you know, coming back next, next year. Now there's some ways for us to like, you know, get by with less than that, but that truly is like the loss, you know, and I know you brought up the like save our stages thing. That's been some of the conversation locally. And this goes for venues too, like that are still closed and are going to be closed for much longer. Like, like there's, there's, there's overhead that goes into all these things. It costs money to put on these cool things. And, and when you have zero revenue for six months and beyond, that's a really hard thing to get through. And we're all getting, getting creative about it. And, but um, there's also a real need for some significant relief help. Well, let's just say society at large needs to understand that it's just a super important part of who yeah. many, many, many people are and what many people depend upon. And yeah, and for us, I mean, the Save Our Stages Act is a, is basically legislation that articulates the gaps with the the first round of of funding that you know, like um, I mean, you know, basically that venues are closed for much longer, and we we sort of you need to acknowledge the nuance. It's different, and and mm-hmm. the, like the paycheck protection plan, the P- PPP was pretty insufficient. Right. And, you know, cause that was based on 60 days of, of closures. And so, you know, I think the big thing is like you're saying is like, it's not only the cultural value, but it's also the value that especially a lot of venues and, and live music in general brings to downtown. If there's no one else that can better make that point than you for Boise, for sure on a national level. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the representatives I was talking to recently from, from Idaho, you know, and I think, I don't think he was as clear on it until we were talking, but like, and he thinks of the music industry, they, they a lot of these leaders think mostly of the big rock stars and the arena shows, but there's a tons of small businesses and, Oh, there's a lot of blue collar workers behind the scenes. There's all these, these, it's a big ecosystem that contributes to local economies in a lot of different ways. Uh, mm-hmm. And it also, from a mental health and cultural value side, it has all those upsides. And so, um, but we're not historically not a very well organized sector. We, you know, it's not in our spirit to like all like organize and wear suits and go, go right. grovel, grovel for, for attention from, from leaders. We're a little more traditionally anti establishment all establishment all yeah sure right <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah so so it's been cool like the the need yeah so what's that been like so what's that been like for you to interface i i yeah. assume you've been talking to like the u.s senator from idaho idaho and yep. representatives and what's been your level of involvement and how's that what's well, that look like from your perspective in all honesty i've been yeah it's you know it's been good they've they've been pretty responsive you know they're political in nature but yeah because we're in a red state we, we have a real opportunity here in Idaho to make a difference. Um, but it is a bipartisan bill, but, you know, being able to interface with NEVA, which has been such a cool organization to come together the way it did. And especially cause it's really focused on the independents, you, 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 you know, and like that, that aren't bankrolled by, by a live nation or something like that. Um, and we've really been trying to tell the story from a small business perspective, which really resonates with you know, especially like representatives from Idaho, like small business, they definitely care about small businesses. And if you can, you know, translate it into that language for them, they, they better see it, you know, you know, mm-hmm. and so um, it's, it's, it's going well, I'm optimistic, it'll happen. I mean, one of the things just saying to one of them last, a couple of weeks ago, too, is like, I mean, it's, it's literally like a hurricane hit, like the music community and, and, and it, it's like a natural disaster, you know, and, and, and we're still wiped out. And so, I mean, what what happens in Florida when a town gets wiped out by a natural disaster like that? There's 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 relief funding. It's not like yeah, we, we don't historically go out asking for help. We're just asking to get to the other side, you, you know, and and to rebuild, you know. And so I think right. there's, for something that you did, it's a natural disaster yeah. from a yeah. from a people getting together perspective, obviously. Yeah, and, and that's, yeah, really, they've been really hesitant. They've been a little hesitant on industry specific stuff. I'm like, I get that, but you know, what do you mean by that? Industry well, specific? you know, they don't want to, you know. Republicans tend, and I, and I appreciate the angle on this. They don't want to pick winners and losers, you, you know. But in this case, you know, kind of the thing is, I think the latest one of the latest numbers from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is about eighty six percent of businesses have reopened in some form. Like, great. Well, there's fourteen percent, and the music community makes up a very large part of that percentage that aren't open yet. So this is there are some industries that are being hit much harder than others. And right, and not open by choice. I mean, because yeah, they can't, because they can't. it's not in the public interest to do so. Well, that's the other thing. So we're gonna we yeah. If, well, in this, you know, when we postponed, we actually postponed before the city closed down, before the state closed down. But by the time the festival would have happened, the city and state were closed down. But we were we we were ahead of 
the curve. So we, they, they didn't tell us to shut down, but we did so because it was obvious it was the right thing to do, you know, from a, pub, yeah. from a public health stand, standpoint. And so what we're, you know, you see, okay, these, but how does that, how does that particular, how does that well, I just bring uh, up fit into the your the argument you're making with the guys that you did it before. Well, now it's like, hey, look, we're we're being good players, and you know, like like you see these pockets of people trying to pull off events, like you know, like the Sturgis rally or something like that. It's like, hey, we might be able to legally fight you on this and go just do shit, but but we recognize that that's not good. Right. For okay. Yeah, health. I get it. We want to be good. We want to be good yeah. citizens, and uh, yeah. and then we get screwed out of money because like we're just trying yeah. to do what's best for the public health. What's yeah. more expensive? That yes, for you exactly. to give us help in the end of the day, or for us yeah. to just do whatever we want to do, send people to hospitals, people get sick, which yeah. is ultimately cost way more. That's a that's your argument. Yeah, and in some of the venues, frustration. It's like it's also they're being told they can't operate. They can't. You know, we're all used to. I mean, we're businesses. We're all used to selling tickets. We know how to be self sufficient. But right now you can't be, but there, people, people are telling me, well, we can't, we don't need money for, for you and you can't open. And it's like, okay, well then what the hell am I supposed to do? Like, <laughs> so that's the most resistance that you're getting is that just you're hearing who you're hearing this from your congressperson or something that they're here. Oh, well, we're hearing from other states that have no venues that don't give a shit that no, the I, senators from Wyoming no. are telling us that, well, there's people like we don't need what they're selling. So to be honest, I'm uh, not, I'm not hearing. I think what it's mostly a blind spot. It's mostly like, they just don't understand no, the music. Right. It's not, not on people's yeah. radar. Yeah. And so like, there hasn't been much resistance once you get to them, but it, I was more expressing some of the frustration from the venue standpoint from those, especially yeah, the, yeah. that aren't part of the conversation. They're frustrated. They're just, you know, cause I'm basically advocating, I'm mostly advocating on behalf of the venue ecosystem here and stuff because I care mm -hmm. about it. It's what we've been trying to build. And I don't want to see it all get wiped out. Plus, we won't have a festival. If there's no venues to be able to put it in, you know. Right. But right. but so the, I was articulating their frustration. But yeah, once you get to these folks, they they start seeing it and they understand. They're like, oh wow, I hadn't even thought it because we're a yeah. That's what's just so important to like just make that trip. You've been to Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Talking yeah. to people there and like yeah. just getting someone in front of them for sitting down for 20 minutes. I mean, I don't know, yeah. really longer than that. But like, even you just get in front of someone yeah. and explain to them like what the impact really is. Everyone loves, 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 loves music. So it's a pretty apolitical thing once you, and if, they just don't know how we operate. They don't realize we're a bunch of small business owners and they don't real, you know, even bands, I mean, bands are small businesses, you know, they're, mm, you know, yeah. they're, most of them are set up like that. And to half time when I'm talking to bands, I'm explaining to them like, Hey, you're a small business. Like you got to think about it like that too, you, you know, mm -hmm. and you can be a very altruistic small business. Being a small business is not a bad word. You know, <laughs> it's like being a, you know, yeah. Um, so anyways, it's so that's, I think, is the big upside of all of this is we're going to be a sector that not, figured out how to get at the table a little bit more than we previously were. From right, um, right. Now have a seat at the table for sure. For, have a seat at the yeah. relief bill table is super important. So yeah. what does that look like? And what like give me the best case scenario of what occurs when uh, this passes? I don't know for sure. And one of the reasons. So I've also been helping lead a charge to get better connected here in the state because theoretically, I know with some of the other stuff, you know, the federal money flows through the state. So it's like, last thing I want to happen is this passes and then our state isn't aware of it for whatever reason. And it somehow gets lost in the mix <laughs> and we don't know how to access yeah. it. So right, I'm not exactly. fully clear on how we access it yet. I haven't gotten to that point of the thing, but um, yeah. yeah. And that's, I've just, you know, through just the activity with Tree Fort and stuff, I've sort of become sort of a default music lobbyist around here, which is not, I mean, only because I'm, I think, I enjoy talking about it and, and I believe in it strongly and I'm, you know, and I'm just a regular advocate and especially for mm -hmm. live music in particular and live music is what's being one of the things being hit the hardest, right? Right now. So I will say though, with all that in mind, it has been nice to take a little breather and just, I go on more walks, I hang out with my daughter more. And so, Oh my but, God, it's a great time to have I, a seven year old. I know exactly. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm optimistic by nature. I think, you know, Live music is loved by so many folks. We're going to find a way back, but you know, it doesn't mean just sit and wait for that to magically happen. It just means we have to put some energy into it. So yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, it gives you this kind of bullshit uh, unforeseeable kind of event gives you a, the hell of a lot of perspective on yeah. a lot of different things. And, yeah. you know, I've been going to a hundred shows a year and I like, Oh, okay. Uh, I still got my, uh, my home stereo and I yeah. got a nice TV and home theater thing. And that's been sounded pretty damn good lately. <laughs> yeah. 
I have to say, it was only like um, a month ago that I finally took my uh, my my earplugs out of my pants pocket because they always just live there. And I suddenly realized, like, well, wait, right. I guess I can take them out for a little bit. Now. <laughs> I forgot about it. Yeah, really. I mean, one of the things like that happened with me was that all these albums, what are oh, like, wow, people yeah. release music? I'm like, yeah. does this happen every year? Because as you know, it's like, That's you're awesome. so involved. I'm like, what people yeah. are like, Hey Josh, what are you listening to? Um, I, well, I've been to like four shows this week and over here and I've seen these guys at this club and this place and this wow. place. And then I'm going to Indy and Madison and I'm flying Love out it. to California and going to Red Rocks or wow. that was my, like, that was my listening. Right. Yeah. I mean, and then between shows, like maybe listening to the band that you got really turned on to at the last, the, the opener for, from two nights ago or three nights ago, right? So Love. now it's like, oh, these guys are, this is a great album and this is what's happening now. It's kind of, mm. you know, you when you have that thirst for music, you're like, what's what can I get that's going on right now? And that's mm. kind of how I operate. Being an independent festival clearly is really, really important to you mm. and is kind of a little bit about what distinguishes, what makes this so interesting with mm. the rise of music in Boise and with tree Ford and everything that you've done to bring music to that community. Um, and now, especially with, uh, the investment project with tree Ford, what are the, what's the, obviously the, the upside is that it's a huge influx of money, but why are you trying? And I'm not saying I'm an advocate of one side of, of their side, but why are you trying to prevent it being bought by live nation and what, what are the pitfalls there from a personal standpoint and what are the pitfalls just from the festival standpoint? Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree. I, there, I'm sure there's, there's, there's definitely upsides obviously from a money standpoint, a stability stand, stand, standpoint, but I think there is something that has just resonated and, and it's resonated with our community and with artists that it's just nice to feel like they're part of something that's a little more based in a community and, you know, it's not, I, and I'll just be honest, like most of the festivals I've seen that have, you know, especially if there's been some, like I was just, you know, and I think people that are involved with it from the get go would agree with me, but uh, B- Bumper Shoot in Seattle is a great example of a community festival mm-hmm. that w- w- was really great and it was a great experience all around. And then once they, and I'm not exactly sure why they, maybe they had to, but they pivoted to like a- AEG, got really involved and stuff. And it just, you could just, yeah. sense the difference like i you know like i went to it actually i did sound it after that with built to spill and you know it, it just was a different experience and 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 there's something about like most of tree fort is ran by people that and i love everyone in the music industry is no but is mostly ran by pe- people that have other jobs have other things and this is just what they do as a passion project and when pe- people bring things when people do things as a passion project it just it's different than when they do it as a job and so there's elements of that. And, and I think it is like, we make a lot of decisions that, you know, and if you're thinking about investing, I, I want to be really clear on this is that we make a lot <laughs> yeah. of decisions that aren't that, that, that are more purpose, much more purpose driven and then the bottom line driven. And, and, and I think if, if there were investors at the table that were only looking for a financial return on, on, on it, not to say that people at live nation, that's all they care about. But I think at some level when you're, a big corporation like that, there's someone that the, 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 the bean counters are trying to squeeze the beans and, and uh, yeah. Or publicly owned that doesn't, yeah. you know, the answer to say shareholders exactly. in, in a particular so, way, but yeah, you guys are going about it in an interesting so way. So being able to make, I guess, I don't want to say bad business decisions, but question for that was like, no, it's just like, so I think we've always just been, you know, really. You want to continue to have the community in mind yeah. and you want to stay true to the values yeah. of the, yeah of the festival that you went yeah. that you started yeah. with but i will say as we mature and there may be a time we're partnering with some other established entity out there that in, in a way on our terms could be valuable and it feels like maybe a, a maturing thing it's very natural in this industry that i don't think the business side of it is a is bad all around i think that you know most people if they're in music they're they're pretty like all all altruistic to begin with um but yeah so so i i i'm not an anti big business perspective i kind of share a, a a line about that but it it is there is some sort of like probably pride around it too we we like being independent and so so where do you see tree fort in like five years in the boise and and how and does boise generally follow the scene in boise would generally follow 
the trajectory that you would like to envision for tree fort? I think so. Yeah. You know, in five years, I mean, it's, it's a weird time to think of in the future too hard, but you know, I, yeah, that's true. Like what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get the let's get the save the sages our yeah. act first. I mean, you're but, absolutely, you're absolutely right. I think but. my hope for Tree Fort as an entity and and the cause in general is that we can e- even if say all the downtown parking lots are gone and we can't have a main stage downtown and stuff, that if we can find a way to continue to just be this catalyzing force, you know, for the arts community and creative community here, we've talked about it. there may be a time where Tree Fort's purpose in Boise passes, and I don't think any of us are so attached to it existing. Like if it stops serving a purpose then I, I think we would all be ready to, we're, to move on but as long as it's serving a, a purpose right. i think it'll have a purpose for a long time but it's hard to say i think ideally there's gonna be a thriving live music scene there's gonna be more more venues that tree right. will continue to be a very important piece of that ecosystem but if you had to kind of move then it would be more on the promotion side and duck club obviously it's not, yeah yeah totally yeah. or yeah, yeah 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 um you know i i it's a good, it sounds like a good yeah I, I mean i i don't know yeah. i've just i've never been great at planning too far into the future i'm pretty in the moment about things so yeah yeah well that's good but look how it's turned out though man you've done you've done just so many great things and Thanks. i mean i'm not even from boise and i'm grateful for what you're doing there. well you're gonna have to come now i think you would love it i do i absolutely i and i have to exactly. now you're shit yeah. september 2020 September 2021 or all. Well, we we have a podcast stage now or we have like part of the story for it. You could uh, come out and you could do some interviews. Oh right, yeah, just to interview a whole bunch of different bands. Okay, I'm in. It's on the it's on the record yeah. now, dude. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, well, man, this has been really fun. I really appreciate you're just super generous with your time and um it's great congrats stuff. Congrats on the new pod- podcast. I'm excited to hear it roll out. It's, obviously, it's right right in my wheelhouse because I'm a uh, live music junkie. So Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, good luck with everything. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks again for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Talk to you soon. Okay, there you have it. Eric Gilbert of the Tree Fort Music Festival. I want to thank him for uh, that wonderful in- information and interview on Road Case. Um, You know, I really love Eric's DIY spirit that has uh, built up Tree Fort to uh, bring over 442 bands in 2019 uh, from the first Tree Fort Festival in 2012, where there was 137 bands. Now their bands are featured all over the city in like over 30 different venues. And Eric, in large part, is responsible for bringing so many bands to Boise, and I applaud him for that. I also applaud him for his efforts on the national stage with Neva and the Save Our Stages Act, which, as we know now, uh, has passed. So we will get the much needed economic resources into the hands of those all over the live music industry, everyone from performers to venue workers to tax, etc. cetera, uh, everyone that has been negatively impacted by the live music shutdown across the country. And I thank Eric for his efforts uh, to help pass that act and get money to those that need it. So again, I want to thank Eric for being on Roadcase. I wish him personally the best of luck, and I wish the best for the Treat Fort Festival, uh, and I hope to be there uh, next year in September of 2021. Thanks, Eric. Thanks again so much for listening. And I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with Roadcase. You can do so in a number of different ways. You can email me at info at roadcasepod.com with questions, comments, and even suggestions for guests. Or you can follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at Roadcase Pod. And we have a YouTube channel called Roadcase Podcast. And if you are able to and like to support Roadcase, we have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And if you could please rate and review the podcast while you're there, that would be great. So I want to thank Waltzer for this awesome theme music that we have. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Roadcase. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, so I'll see you on down the road.